morning, everyone. Welcome to the Education Committee. And uh, we'll start with the usual items on the agenda. And I don't know the first, what's the apologies for absence that we have. Thanks. Councillor Wallace. Sorry? Uh, Councillor Wallace, for apologies. Excellent, thank you. Do we have any others, Leona? Um, no. Uh, Councillor Cannon is at a meeting just now up the stairs, so he might appear in that. I don't know. And I don't think we have any online participation? No? no okay. All right, thank you. And uh, obviously, uh, the next item is then declarations of interest. Have any? No. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to then uh, item three on the agenda, uh, which is the Education Scotland report on Braidbar Primary School and uh, Nursery class. And this is from, I believe, Janice. Thank you. Thank you, convener. This paper informs the Education Committee of the report by Education Scotland on Braidbar Primary School and Nursery class. The school and nursery class were inspected by Education Scotland in March 2023. Under the short model arrangements, Education Scotland evaluated two quality indicators and provided a short report detailing strengths and areas for improvement. A copy of the report is included as part of your appendices. In assessing the two indicators of quality, Education Scotland found both aspects of the work of the nursery class and the school to be very good. These aspects were learning, teaching and assessment and securing children's progress, raising attainment and achievement. The key strengths are listed in paragraph 8 of the cover paper. They include the enthusiastic, confident and articulate children who are very proud of their school. The strong sense of teamwork and positive relationships across the whole school. The head teacher's continued focus on empowering staff, children and families to lead school improvement and how it's having a positive impact on outcomes for children and the consistently high levels of attainment and achievement across the school. This is a very good report on an East Remshire nursery class and school, with the evaluations made by Education Scotland reflecting the continued commitment and efforts by the school leadership team with the support of parents and carers to ensure the children of Braid Bar achieve the best possible outcomes. The inspection team agreed two areas for improvement with the nursery class and school and with the education department. And these are teachers in the school should continue to develop the quality of feedback they provide to children about their learning. This will better help children know what they need to do next to continue to improve. It will better support children to develop personal targets to increase ownership of their learning and progress. Staff in the nursery should continue to improve further the use of the range of information information to ensure a coherent overview of children's progress over time across the curriculum. Appendix 2 of the paper sets out the nursery class and school's action plan to address the agreed areas for improvement. The Quality Improvement Service will work closely with the school and leadership team to support its implementation and revisit within two years of the date of the publication of the report. And they will review the impact of this action plan in addressing the agreed areas of improvement. Education Committee is asked to note and comment on the contents of the Education Scotland reports on Braid Bar Nursery Class and Primary School and improve the school and nursery class action plan to agree the addressed areas for improvement. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Janice. And just uh, before members uh, note and comment and approve the action plan, uh, I'm very glad to say we have Gillian Friel with the head teacher with us this morning. And I'd like to invite you to possibly say a few words, Julie. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted that Education Scotland got the opportunity to visit Braidbar Primary School and Nursery Class, where they were very impressed by our enthusiastic, confident and articulate children who are very proud of their school. They highlighted our strong sense of teamwork and positive relationships across the whole school, which I am proud of, as relationships are at the heart of everything that we do at Braidbar. The report highlighted our nurturing and inclusive ethos in both the school and nursery, and as a result, our children feel safe, valued and respected. At Braid Bar, all staff create positive learning environments which are underpinned by the school's values and children's rights, for which we have just recently received a gold award. 
The report highlighted that all staff and children focus on ensuring our values of kindness, ambition and creativity are evident in all aspects of school life. At Braid Bar, our children contribute well to the life of the school through a wide range of pupil leadership roles, and the young leaders of learning also have a key role in supporting our improvement plan using How Good Is Our School to support their work. I was delighted that the team recognised that staff, children and families are empowered to lead school improvement, which is having a positive impact on outcomes for our children. Close partnership working with parents and families is very important to us, Therefore, I was delighted that within the report, the inspection team have highlighted this as practice worth sharing more widely. They recognised that we have a highly effective approach to working in partnership with children and parents to build a culture of equality. I am very pleased that the report highlighted that all children from nursery to primary seven are provided with opportunities to develop skills for learning, life and work, as this is a key feature of our curriculum rationale. Across the school year, all children participate in real life relevant learning contexts through Spotlight Skills sessions. These sessions include food and health, community and design and manufacturing. I was delighted that they also identified our Spotlight Skills sessions as practice worth sharing more widely. Through these real life learning experiences, leadership roles and clubs across the school, our children have very good opportunities to achieve success. The evidence of achievement across the school shows that our children make a significant contribution to the life and work of the school. The report also highlights the consistently high levels of attainment across the school, which is a result of the hard work and dedication of their teachers. I am particularly proud that the inspection team recognised the effective use of pupil equity funding to support improvements in literacy and wellbeing. As a result, they report that very good progress is being made towards improving outcomes and closing the poverty-related attainment gap through well-planned interventions. The report confirms that our nursery children are making very good progress in early language and communication, early mathematics and health and wellbeing. Braidbar Primary School and Nursery Class are very well placed to take forward the recommendations in our report, due primarily to the dedication and collegiality of the staff. I would like to thank all members of the staff team, teachers, pupil support assistants, child development officers, early years play workers, the clerical team, facilities management and of course all our wonderful partners for their enthusiasm and commitment. I would also like to thank the convener of education and all members of the education committee for their support. Also thank you to the quality improvement team and the education department who provide invaluable ongoing support and advice. Of course, my biggest thanks goes to the children of Brave Bar Primary and Nursery Class, who every day demonstrate our values of kindness, ambition and creativity. Our children are motivated and engaged, and they have a thirst for learning. We are incredibly proud of them every day as they continue to grow and develop their skills and experience success. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gillian. Uh, it's especially nice to hear the, the, about the children and how, they, how happy they are. At the school. Do we have any comments or questions? Councillor Pagnell? Thank you. I, I just want to start by congratulating Gillian and all the staff and pupils at Braid Bar Primary School. This is an excellent achievement and I look forward to see what, seeing what you do next. Um, it's also important to highlight that the uh, literacy, literacy and English attainment grade uh, are very good and I think this is a great achievement considering um, 41% of the children English is a second language and this is something that we should be celebrating. Um, I had one question and that's on areas for improvement. Are the department uh, confident that time scales can be met? Absolutely, 100%. Um, I'd say it's a very good report and I think when you read the text it's part of the, the inspection findings you'll see that that very good report's not accidental. It's been down to the capacity, the leadership, the commitment and the hard work of the staff with the support of um, the parents and partners. So absolutely confident that these areas will be overtaken, but other aspects of the school will continue to, to improve. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Councillor Pagan. Any other questions? Fiona? Can I just say, well done, it was an excellent report, absolutely del delighted to read it. Um, one thing I would like to um, point out, it was very pleasing on page 16, paragraph 2, 
um, to read that the children learn through a progressive religious and moral education programme. Um, that really, really um, shone out to me, Andy. I thank you for that. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, and I believe uh, with Councillor Merrick. Thanks, Convener. Uh, I'd just like to congratulate Gillian and all her staff. Uh, we, we see reports like this and, and we recognise how excellent they are, how, how much has, how good it is for the children, how great it is for the community, how great it is for, for them in their lives ahead with that a thirst for learning. I mean, that, that kind of sums up uh, exactly what we want for our children. Uh, and then also to uh, to to help them get over that thirst, which is the next part of what we do. But a massive congratulations to Gillian. What we don't always see immediately here is the amount of sheer hard, dedicated work that went into doing all this, that kind of love, dedication and, and, and hard, hard graft. But this is the outcome. This is making people's lives better. This is giving our children the best chance they possibly could have in whatever kind of world they find themselves in. So thank you very much to the, obviously, the education department as well. To Gillian, to all the staff, to the parents and the children, and everybody, all the partners that we heard mentioned uh, for, for this wonderful report. Thank you, Councillor Merrick. Do we have any other comments or questions? Councillor O'Donnell. It's nothing new from what you've already heard. Congratulations, Gillian. It is a remarkable, remarkable report. And it's obviously, you won't take the whole credit yourself. You, you will know that that's all about team effort. and everyone working together uh, to get tremendous results so that's great the thing that struck me is what councillor pragnell said this this is all despite having 41 percent of, of english as a second language so i think it's even the more remarkable for that so really well done to everyone on this great set of results thank you thank you councillor donald any other questions or comments uh, i'd just like to finally say Gillian, you know um there's so many terms and detail in the report. They're excellent to see in the ethos of the school and the diversity that we've, we've all commented on. And I'd like to echo what Councillor Merrick was saying as well about the partnership, the teamwork, and everything. Um, but uh, just a final comment, and, uh, and it's to congratulate you um, on your leadership and the, everything you've done for the school and the children. Um, it's very much appreciated. Okay, thank you. And. Uh, so, uh, finally, sorry, we should, um, we've noted and commented, and we need to um, obviously approve the action plan. Are members happy to do so? Thank you. And um, I'm quite happy if, um, obviously, I'm assuming you would like to be back at the school and, um, with your children. So, <laughs> so thanks very much for your time. Lovely to see you. Okay. And we shall move on to the next item uh, on the agenda, thank you, uh, which is a draft numeracy and a mathematics strategy from 2326. And I believe this is, oh, I can read my notes, I think it's you again, Janice. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. The purpose of this report is to seek Education Committee approval for the numeracy and mathematics strategy refresh 23 to 26. The refresh strategy can be found on page 33 of your papers. The strategy links clearly to the Education Department's vision, everyone attaining, everyone achieving through excellent experiences, and sets out three main areas, attainment and achievement, learners' experiences and stakeholders, detailing how we will ensure that all children and young people develop the numeracy and mathematics skills they need to be successful through life. The strategy challenges all involved to make mathematics more inspiring, enjoyable and relevant to real life and, as a result, to increase enthusiasm, encourage greater participation and raise attainment. It also takes into account the wider national agenda set out in the National Response to Improve the Mathematics Summary Report. Page 36 of your papers and page 4 of the strategy details the strategy aims to improve and these include improving outcomes and reduce inequalities in numeracy mathematics development, improve attainment and achievement in numeracy mathematics through the broad general education and senior phase, improve approaches to learning, teaching and assessment through the provision of high quality professional learning opportunities, 
to develop the real life skills of pupils, school leavers and adults, and to improve the opportunities for parents and carers to meaningfully engage in their child's learning and achievement. The strategy builds on the existing very good practice in East Remshire, using up-to-date research and evidence, and ensuring that numeracy and mathematics have a central and continuous focus in our education. As detailed in paragraph 20 of the cover paper, in formulating this numeracy and mathematics strategy, East Renfrewshire Council Education Ta Department has demonstrated its commitment to taking into account the views of stakeholders, staff from early years, primary, secondary schools, adult learning services and other key partners contributed to this process, and consultations with parents, children and young people also took place. Education Committee is asked to approve the draft numeracy and mathematics refresh strategy and ask the Director of Education to report to Education Committee on the impact of its implementation. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Janice. And uh, we will ask for any notes or comments from the Committee. Oh, Councillor Pragman. Uh, thank you. On page 45, it mentions reporting on the progress and measuring success. Um, again, it's about targets. Um, are the department... Sorry, I'll let you get to that page. Are the department confident that this strategy, strategy will enable East Remshire to achieve the targets set for 2023-26? I know recent benchmarking shows that we're improving all the time, but are you, do you believe this strategy will fully uh, enable this to happen? I think the targets are ambitious, um, but they, they're where we would have been if there wasn't a pandemic, and we are seeing signs of recovery, but we are realistic that there's a lot of hard work. I think, as demonstrated in even just the previous paper, we are seeing the impact of the previous strategy, albeit the lifetime of that was interrupted. So we, we are from a very good baseline, and we know there's things that we, we still need to focus on, and this strategy gives us that focus. But it's also the hard work that sits behind it, like the professional learning, like the, the role of the quality improvement team, like the use of pupil equity funding. So with that determination and hard work, I would be confident that these are ambitious but achievable. Um, and as indicated, we would give a regular update. And if there was something that we thought we needed to, to maybe support in a different way, then we would amend the strategy and, and, and work towards that. But Short answer, yes. That was a long answer, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Janice. Any other comments or observations? Councillor Zonal? I've actually got a few, um, if you can indulge me. Um, one should be very straightforward, and I'm sure I've asked this before, and I can never remember the, 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 the difference. Participation data versus um, positive destinations. I always get confused as to what... Positive destinations get participation data. I'm not so sure about. Um, second, we don't explicitly reference the impact of COVID and some of the declines on the numbers, but I think it would be helpful to, you know, comment on that that we saw since 2020. Um, I know we've commented on that in other reports, but we're not explicit on that here. Um, third point is really about parent participation in maths, right? That's uh, that's a challenge, right? And and as someone who did maths at first year at university, my, my child was beyond me at, uh, at year four in terms of remembering all, all this stuff. So that is a, a real challenge. So how are we actually going to make that, that work? You know, uh, one thought is online tools so that actually is, uh, that, that, that helps parents actually understand the stuff a bit better. But that's, that's a real challenge. Finally, I think you've alluded to the targets for 23-26 really are very much welcome these. These are very ambitious <coughs> um, and, and good to see, but it is actually over quite a, a short period of time. So, you know, in terms of the confidence in that, specifically, um, it, it, I think it looks as if we're looking for complete elimination of the uh, uh, poverty attainment gap on numeracy, if I understand that correctly. Now, if that's true, and that's what you're standing up for, that in this sort of time period, that will be genuinely remarkable. So I just want to make sure it's not a typo, and uh, <laughs> that, that you're, we're signing up on that uh, on that area. So quite a few questions, if you don't mind. 
Yeah, I've scribbled it down, so hopefully um, I've not missed out. The school leaver destination is basically just as it says for like children who leave school and do they have a positive destination, and that's measured at two points through the year when they initially leave school, but then also a follow-up about that sustained. The annual participation measure actually is a longer period of time, and that involves working with key partners, and that's about... In a lot of ways, that's an accurate measure because it's a snapshot of any day at time. You can go in and look at it. But it's kids and young people who are maybe in employment or age nine, it goes up to age 19. So in a lot of ways, it's not just in our gift, the annual participation measure, whereas the school leaver, um, the schools have got a lot more input. But the annual participation measure is one that um, is liked by a lot of national policy documents, although I believe school leaver destinations will now be uh, included because of that sort of in charge of like, your own sort of destiny. That To say that, though, our annual participation measure has been the highest nationally um, the last two years, so we do we do recognise that our partners work very well with us in work history and in particular. The COVID we are trying to move away from talking about the impact of COVID as a huge generalisation. We're trying to focus on what is the impact. So um, when we are thinking about COVID and we are saying, for example, children in primary ones attainment's not as good as children in P3 and 4, we're saying why. And instead of talking about the impact of COVID, we're actually talking about something that's tang tangible. These children's communication skills are not as highly developed as they would have been if they hadn't had a piece. So we're then able to channel channel our resources um, into that. And that, if I could maybe jump to, to the fourth point about trying to reduce that poverty-related attainment gap, we've got to try and be ambitious. We've got to have ambitious targets. We are now receiving money, albeit not a lot of money, but if you combine that with our PEF and our and the SAFE money and our plans to really target um, um, resource and be proportionate in our approach and give what we have that equitable who needs it most, then we have to see a, an outturn for that. So it's not a typo. It is very ambitious. Um, but I do think it's achievable if everyone works um, towards that. The signs before the pandemic, we were closing the gap. We do have signs where the gap does reduce in certain ages and stages. So we need to look, use that information to, to make improvements and learn. But um, it, it will be a relentless focus and um, we are realistic. We know that we can't do it on our own. Some of the barriers to learning are uh, out with our gift. But we, as a department and between all our remits, we work extremely closely together so that there, I mean, it's that promise to children. I don't mean that promise that, um, just for care experience. It's that promise that we want to make a difference while they're with us. So that's why the target is so ambitious. And it's also to um, make people sit up and notice. Uh, so it was quite deliberate. Closely aligned to our stretch aims, but, um, and we'll, we'll t talk about that in the new session when I'll be bringing an update on uh, the impact we've had so far. The parents is one of the aims that, and at activities that's rolled over from the last, because we were... Uh, just starting to engage with schools and how they, they, they engage parents when lockdown happened. We know that's a really steep curve because uh, although schools this year have opened their doors and parents are back in, there's still so all sorts of anxieties and there's also still people with anxieties of, as maths and, and we've talked about this and it features actually in the review that I brought um, last March about the maths review um, People seem to think it's acceptable and they say, oh, I'm rubbish at maths, but they wouldn't say, I'm rubbish at reading. There's almost a hierarchy of skill um, between people and it's about trying to make that maths relevant. It's trying to say to them it's an everyday skill. You use it all the time. It's a life skill. But we do talk in jargons and acronyms in education and we do like it to be a secret code. So part of it is making it accessible. And that accessibility is just about the language, that common language that schools use from school to school, from primary to nursery to high school, everybody. Also about, so taking out that mystery of it, showing parents the methods that the children are learning 
and there's lots of lots of excellent practice already happening in our schools but supporting the confidence of the staff to let the parents in to build their confidence and using our, our children as learners as, we, uh, as teachers as well so there's lots of good practice there's lots of things we can do but one of the big things is just probably that that sort of positive mindset that attitude to maths and uh, not just for our parents but societal so that that would be the attempt i don't know if you want to maybe just a specific point um on the parental one, I do think there's a there's opportunities now with um, some of the resources that were created, particularly during COVID, um, around some of those video resources. Um, the West Partnership through West Online School continues to develop a range of resources. Uh, they've developed a huge number this um, session, and certainly that sort of broad general education, the sort of primary into early secondary, which is probably where you you most you get the greatest gain, I think, in terms of that support for children's learning um, I think there are opportunities there where the, the, the sort of approach that we've done for a number of years and we, we need to invest in it further around bringing parents into school providing workshops on this is how you, you, you do multiplications is how you do fractions some of those key areas that parents say I can't even remember how you do that or you do it differently to how I do it dad you know I mean that's what my own children tell me they say what do you know about maths and I say well I've got a doctorate in maths but that doesn't seem to make any difference to them um, so there's something about supporting parents well to be able to work with their children but I think the online bit gives us an, a, a fresh angle to look at that. Um, I attended one of those workshops and the number of parents that were sweating during that um, and waiting for their homework to be marked it was it was uh, it was quite incredible just just going back to so it is an ongoing challenge right and it's that's not going to be solved overnight um, just going back to that COVID point, that there was a specific issue, though, in terms of like for like, like in terms of how the the exams were marked during that time. So there is a, can we really compare then anyway? Um, but I take your point that you want to get beyond COVID, and I think that's that's a good attitude for the department, and that's good to hear that we're not going to be blaming COVID, and it's just get on with it and, and, and do the best we can now. So that's great. So thanks for those responses. Very, very good. And the, the poverty attainment gap measure, I, you know, we hit that. We need to really celebrate that because that will, will possibly the first in, in, in Scotland if we do that. So that that will, will be a great, great achievement. And it's we've got line of sight. It's only three years away. So so good luck. Good luck with that. Thank you, Councillor Donald, uh, Mark, Janice. Uh, Councillor Merrick? Just a couple of brief comments. Uh, I think this is an incredibly important document uh, for all the reasons people have already said. Uh, we talked about ambition there. Absolutely, they, they, these are really difficult ambitions, but that's exactly what we want. Uh, I don't think the Education Department have ever made it easy for themselves. Uh, always building up, no sitting back resting on laurels, that does not, just does not happen in the East Renfrewshire Education Department. Uh, what was particularly nice, and uh, Janet highlighted this uh, in her introduction, was involving all the stakeholders, and that includes the parents and, and groups of other people. Uh, th that is so important because that's, that's really where some of the strength and where the ambitions be become realised, I think. Uh, and that how we use the money, any money that comes here, but there'll never be enough money, but it's how that is targeted, particularly at the people who need it most and in the most effective way. And we've seen that anybody who goes around any of our schools can can very quickly pick up how, how efficiently that is used. And it doesn't matter how much we got, it would all be used efficiently if only we could get some more. Uh, so it's an incredibly important document. Uh, that, that whole thing about... Uh, parents not being uh, involved. There's a confidence aspect there. Uh, children are learning things now that will, you know, kids in our schools will learn far more than we will ever know. Uh, and, and that's something to be celebrated. But there's a confidence thing with parents. And I do remember when my own children, I also have a degree in mathematics, so I'm fairly comfortable with maths and such, and arithmetic too, mind you. But uh, I remember trying to help them with their homework and the teachers saying, we don't do it like that anymore. And my world collapsed around me. 
but but I learned how they do it their way very quickly. So uh, good luck with the strategy, and, and it's we look forward to hearing updates along the way, uh, which to see how we're how we're progressing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Merrick, and uh, as a parent as well, I can echo what uh, all the parents have said in this room about, uh, and again, having a degree in mathematics doesn't seem to really count. Uh, so, um, yeah, well, obviously, it's great to learn from your children. And, uh, I do think um, there was something you touched upon, actually, um, when we were talking about the previous report as well. You mentioned it, um, and there was elements already in there of, um, I think, a focusing resources and for specific children who needed the particularly with numeracy or literacy um, to actually um, and it was part of obviously that very good report that education is probably I think recognised that. Um, so it's happening I think hopefully already, you know, in the school this you know this is an ongoing strategy, this is a refresh. So um, it's uh, I think there's been lots of other comments about the and questions about it. Um, so we are asked now uh, to uh, approve the draft numeracy and mathematics strategy and ask the director to report to the education committee on the impact of, the implement, of his implement, implementation, which obviously is a key part of it that you know we get regular updates on it to see if we can actually achieve these ambitious, tar ambitious targets. I sincerely hope we do. Uh, committee happy to do so? Thank you. Okay, we uh, can then move on to item five now on the agenda, uh, which is the home to school transport <coughs> transport policy, and I believe this will be Graham that will be presenting this. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, convener. Um, so the purpose of this report is to update committee on the results of the non-statutory consultation undertaken over recent weeks uh, and seek approval for the introduction of a new home to school transport policy for session 23-24, starting in August. Uh, as members will recall, a draft version of this policy was submitted to the previous meeting of the Education Committee um, back in April. Uh, the policy effectively seeks to bring existing practice together uh, in a single document to provide greater clarity to parents, pupils and their staff on the provision of school transport. And it is based on Scottish Government's own guidance on school transport, which was updated in autumn 21. At the previous meeting, it was agreed that a consultation would be undertaken on the draft policy to seek the views of stakeholders. Um, and it's important to note, whilst there is no statutory requirement for a consultation to be undertaken, it was recognised it was important to do so um, in these circumstances. Turning to the main body of the report itself, uh, members will note the full details of the consultation process, which ran throughout May. Uh, the consultation was primarily undertaken through an online survey, with the questions included as Appendix 1. But as noted in Paragraph 6, separate sessions were held with different groups to ensure their views were incorporated. Um, there was a good response to the online survey, and we had 136 responses received. Um, I'd note that almost all of these were indeed from parents and carers, um, but encouragingly, encouragingly, there was a good spread of responses from different schools across the authority, um, with the most popular ones noted in paragraph 8. Members will note there was a strong response supporting the draft principles, which informed the development of the full policy, with 76% expressing support, and this is, of course, very welcome. The second part of the consultation provided stakeholders with an opportunity to provide additional comments on other matters relating to school transport provision. Um, a number of different comments were received, as we would expect, uh, on these, and these have been aggregated together in the various sections from paragraph 11 onwards. Um, there are a number of these detailed in the report, and I, I do not intend to go through each of these individually. However, I can pick up a few of, of the more common ones that were raised. Um, firstly, uh, concerns about travel distances and safe walking routes. I know that this is an issue um, that many elected members will be familiar with. Um, I just want to stress that this draft policy does not make any changes to the existing eligibility criteria, which have been in place since the beginning of the 2006-2007 school session, and that set at two miles from primary pupils and three miles for secondary pupils. Uh, and this is, in fact, a more generous offering than the statutory requirements. First, I appreciate some families believe this to be inappropriate. Uh, any changes to this would, of course, have to be a decision for elected members to take. For committee's information, I provided some conservative estimates of the likely costs of any changes, um, with initial estimates suggesting an additional cost of anywhere for upwards from about £2.3 million pounds per year. Um, I think it is just really important, though, to note that even if these changes were to take place, there would be a significant risk to the deliverability of 
any such changes due to the already limited supply that we see from local providers in terms of the vehicles that are available. Um, already, we've got quite a, a few contracts that are provided from providers based all around the country. There's a couple come up from Ayrshire every day to provide contracts, uh, and I'm sure members will you know, be familiar. There's a number of other authorities who have experienced challenges uh, with providing school transport over recent years due to similar issues that they've faced. With regards to safe walking routes, again, I just want to stress that the policy makes no changing changes to the existing practice. All routes are assessed by the Department's Health and Safety Advisor based on the West of Scotland Road Safety Forum guidelines, and crucially, make an assumption that children are accompanied to and from school. Ultimately, it is up to a parent or carer to determine whether they believe any route to be appropriate for their child to walk unaccompanied. Turning to ESM provision, members will note that the consultation contains a specific section on this provision. Encouragingly, a number of comments recognise the value of this provision for families. And members will note that, given the specific needs of individual children and young people, there is an added complexity to this type of transport, and there is a strong recognition that came through from the consultation responses of the work being undertaken by our schools and the department to make this support available. And that is, of course, very welcome. If I can draw members' attention to paragraph 14 in particular, uh, members will note that some comments were received in relation to the length of time that pupils can occasionally have to spend on a vehicle. Um, it is worth noting that a lot of work is undertaken with colleagues and transport to make improvements to journey times throughout the year. However, understandably, this does remain a concern for families. Given this particular feedback, um, the policy looks to achieve a degree of greater equity between the ASN and mainstream transport with the introduction of collection points in line with Scottish Government's guidance. Um, as detailed in the policy itself, these collection points will be in easily accessible locations, usually covered bus shelters or another kind of covered location, um, perhaps alternatively a local school if that is more appropriate for families. And these will be a very short distance from individual home addresses. Um, I just think it is also though important to stress that in circumstances where a pupil has been assessed as being unable um, to make it to that point, or there is a physical mobility or another um, sort of issue that would affect that. Um, we will, of course, put arrangements in place to ensure that they will be collected um, from a home address, if that is more appropriate. Given the more efficient routes that are able to be achieved, we are confident that this will lead to significant improvements in journey times, with ultimately an improved experience for the young people um, relying on school transport. But I think it is also just important to recognise there are wider benefits here that, to be achieved in terms of the opportunities around um, supporting young people to develop further life skills as well, and that is again recognised through the Scottish Government's own guidance. So, as a result of the consultation, a small number of amendments have been made to the final policy document, which is attached as Appendix 2. Subject to Education Committee's approval, work will be undertaken over the coming weeks to plan transport provision for the new session, with the intention that the new policy will apply from the beginning of the 2023-24 school session from August. Education Committee is therefore asked to note the comments on the results of the consultation, note and comment on the results of the consultation, apologies, uh, and approve the home to school transport policy to apply from the forthcoming session. Um, so thank you and I'd, I'd be happy to take any questions related to this. Thank you, Graham. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, so, uh, I'll let Frank go first, Danny. Okay. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'm just curious, um, has there been an analysis of the present situation? How many pupils are, for example, walking, cycling, going by car or going by public transport, because if we're going to have an effective policy, surely we need a base level and then be able to compare it after the policy is introduced to see what improvements take place. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I suppose on that point, the, in terms of mainstream transport, there are no changes. The, the whole purpose of this policy is just to, I suppose, codify the existing practice that's already in place. Um, there is a lot of work ongoing at the moment um, in terms of the Environment Department are taking forward a, a wider sort of local transport strategy, um, which has a, a potent, an important element about school transport as well. And that's obviously we've been doing a lot of work around active travel. Um, there's obviously, I think it's referenced in the report, um, just around the sort of school street opportunities and things that I think are real, real benefits that we can take forward. And we're looking to see how we incorporate more of these kind of opportunities within our schools and how that can impact on active travel. Um, so I suppose. I'd, I have not got details to hand on terms of those specifics. Individual schools they took forward their own local transport plans. Um, but the, the sort of um, policy, I suppose, itself, um, we're not making any, any changes at all actually to mainstream transport provision. Um, so they've been kind of not a direct comparison, I suppose, to make in terms of that regard. Thank you, 
Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good okay, Frank? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Council Devlin? Uh, a couple of questions. I mean, you, you talk about, you know, the, the safe walking routes. You know, what's changing the policy from, say, five years ago until today in regards to, I'll use an example, Loch Lebo and Erie and Barhead have been told that the they will no longer get school transport after August. Can you fill me in on the reason why? <coughs> yeah, um, so from my understanding, the Safe Walking Route guidance, as I said, it's based on the West of Scotland Road Safety Forum guidelines, right. have been consistent. Uh, I, I'm not aware of any kind of major, now, there may be kind of small amendments that happen to that, yeah. just as, as would. Um, from base of what, so I suppose in that specific situation, uh, as noted, obviously, the existing you know, this new policy doesn't make any changes to that, that current provision. I think that's just important to stress. Um, on that specific circumstance, what's happened is that uh, kind of on an annual basis, we do make reviews of existing policy, or existing arrangements that are in place. Um, obviously, we don't review every single one every single year, just given the scale of it. But the team do review these just to make sure that obviously there's an existing or there's a continuing eligibility for those pupils who are accessing transport. Um, from my understanding, in that specific situation, a crossing point was installed a few years ago, um, which effective, I, I can't remember the name of the exact road, but there's a crossing point now at what is quite a busy junction, um, that, busy wasn't, junction. that wasn't previously there. Um, so effectively, because that point, that pedestrian crossing, didn't previously exist, that is why transport had been provided on safety grounds in the past. Now that point has been installed, um, there isn't no, there's no longer that sort of safety requirement that yeah. previously existed, uh, and it's on that basis then that the transport, there's, there's not long, no longer a requirement for that transport to right. continue. So that's, that's where I disagree. I mean, the Loch Lieber Road is probably one of the most horrendous roads in East Renfrewshire for traffic and pedestrians crossing. That day pedestrian crossings were put in about four or five years ago, and they've been changed that many times because the, the, the properties round about, I think there's two or three properties, maybe one or two, have got their own individual traffic lights outside the property to gain access and whatever. But nothing's changed with the safety round about that area. Absolutely nothing. It's still a very, very complicated set of uh, traffic lights that uh, I wouldn't allow my kid to walk up and down that street unless I was with them. But to ask a kid to walk to school from there, I, I think it's totally unacceptable through the health and safety. Just one other thing, you know, has the roads department been involved in us? In, in terms of this yeah. policy, certainly they've, they had sight of the initial policy that was, um, when, you know, we consulted with them prior to the, the draft policy being developed and brought to committee. Yeah, last I would yeah. just like a full reassessment done in that area before we implement this policy and uh, the, the children from that area, because I feel it's a very unsafe route. That's, could, we, could I maybe say that we sort of separate the policy from the specific implementation? Yeah. So the, the policy is the same as what is already in place. Um, so as Mr Hayes saying, they would regularly assess different areas to look at routes. But I'm happy to ask corporate health and safety colleagues again to have a look at that. We have to take their guidance. You'll appreciate, you'll appreciate this is not somebody in the education department deciding which routes are safe. So we need to make sure there's a consistency across all the, the, the roads and the estates, so we're happy to take their guidance, and if that one is assessed and not suitable, then we could review that. But the, the advice we're receiving from them so far is that that is a safe work, walking route, yeah, subject to... I, 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 I mean, and that's part of the difficulty, Councillor yeah. Devlin, you'll know that parents will come and say we, we disagree with that assessment, you know, in, in, for a variety of different routes, but, you know, we have to have an an agreed methodology and a, a, a consistent approach to that, and so we rely on our colleagues in that way, but happy to take that one specifically yeah. and ask them to review that one, but it's separate to the wider uh, approval that we're looking for from committee this morning. Okay, thank you, and you're happy for that, Councillor Devon. Okay. Uh, any other questions, uh, Councillor Zono? Uh, just a couple of points. Following on Frank's point, um, slip from a slightly different angle, um, about the uh, the two mile versus one mile, you, you've identified the additional cost. That's very helpful for us to get visibility of that. You talk about a climate change assessment on this. 
you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be very curious to know if we, you know, this is modelling, right? It's not prediction. If we went from two to one, what would be the impact on school runs and, and, and uh, car journeys and the impact on that and reducing car transport? I don't expect you to have an answer to that right now, but I, I think that's an interesting sort of thing to look at as we're looking to reduce uh, uh, car journeys over time. Um, and the second one, thing, uh, uh, I really appreciate your comments on the journey times for uh, ASN uh, school uh, uh, pupils. My, my son was very much part of that story, and some of those journeys could get very extended, you know, and it really does lengthen the day uh, for, for the kids. So I'm glad that you've addressed that and are dealing with that. And to be fair, even way back then, you know, there was flexibility and people tried to work around so that, you know, people were listening and stuff like that. But I know it's a, a difficult juggling act, but I appreciate that, that you raised our attention to, to that specific point. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Donnell. Um, can I ask, with regards to, like, the consultation, um, the number of responses in terms of, has there any, been any other previous consultations um, where you've had more or less responses, or do you think that's a, a reasonable amount to give you feed, the feedback required? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it can vary quite significantly. Uh, the consultation certainly was publicised through social media, uh, parent council chairs were consulted, so, you know, there was a range of uh, various stakeholders were consulted with it. it I suppose it just depends. Um, we can get particular points of year, for example, that sometimes you get stronger responses, so it can vary quite significantly. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think we were, we were quite happy with the the response um, that we received, and it was quite evenly mixed. Obviously, you don't end that from people who access transport and also those who, who don't, so you are getting that, you know, both sides on that as well, which was encouraging. Yeah, I think you can see from the people who actually participated, it was something that was significant to them, and um, so that's that's good. Uh, okay, uh, with regards to, to any other comments, any online? Oh, sorry, Fiona. I just wanted to, to ask, um, it, it says about the escorts, escorts are not normally present on mainstream school transport. When are they um, available? It's just, if it was a coach with a lot of children on it, is the driver responsible for seat belts and all these kind of things? Yeah, that, that tends to be the case, that it's the driver that we are responsible. Obviously, we would have the expectation um, that pupils would behave responsibly uh, as well, and we've obviously got a section within that on pupil behaviour and the expectations of pupil behaviour as well. Um, I think escorts we tend to, are, tend to be put in place where there's a specific need for a pupil. So obviously with any ESN transport, that, that is the case, and, and that's very much built in. Um, for mainstream, it would only be if there was a, a particular need um, for a particular pupil, and that would be assessed, and we would make a, a kind of risk assessment approach and um, would be based, would base that on. It's just I've been in a coach with children before, and they really need an adult to, you know, to sort of keep them, keep them safe. But I just wondered if there was any time when it was a coach that, a, a, some, that an adult was on other than the driver. No, it's certainly not my understanding. Um, I think most of most of our mainstream transport contracts are organised through SPT, so there's a, a kind of a level removed, I suppose, that we are from some of this. Um, certainly, I'm happy to kind of get the specifics on what those circumstances would be uh, and happy to share that. Um, but certainly, it's not the, the kind of normal approach in terms of what we put in place. No, that's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, just to let you know that I'm, I'm aware of a specific incident that's happened in the past year where, with regards to uh, the transport provided um, for the children, where um, there was something that the education had, the department had to deal with, with regards to what you're talking about, with a, another adult being on the coach, and it was so resolved, and the, it was a parent that had a specific issue. So we do listen, and you know, well, with the education department listen and deal, deal with these things, the school transport service, as and when required, you know, to make sure that uh, the children um, are appropriately and looked up. Yeah, if that helps. Uh, any other questions? Is there anything from or comments? Uh, okay, so uh, we have noted and commented on the results of the consultation. Um, are the committee happy to approve the home to school transport policy? As it stands. Great. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you. And uh, we'll move on to the last item now on the agenda, uh, which is the East Renfrewshire Council response to. 
the Scottish Government's consultation on prescribing the minimum annual number of learning and hours, and this will is going to be Joe. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Uh, good morning again, everyone. The report commencing on page 69 of the combined set of papers provides detail of the Scottish Government's consultation on the prescription of the minimum annual number of learning hours of school education people should receive each year. Currently, the number of days a school must be opened each year is defined in legislation at 190 days. However, the number of learning hours that schools must provide is not currently defined in legislation. Legislation does make provision for Scottish ministers to set the minimum number of learning hours. However, until now, this has not been enacted. It is in accordance with this legislation that ministers now propose to use this power to make regulations later this year. In March 2023, the Scottish Government published a consultation seeking views on its plans to set a standard legal minimum number of hours of school education for primary, secondary and special schools that would be applicable to all schools across the country. The suggested number of minimum learning hours for each of the sectors aligns with the current practice in East Renfrewshire schools, with primary schools learners receiving 950 hours per annum, or 25 hours per week, and secondary pupils receiving 1,045 hours per annum, or 27.5 hours per week. Children attending school are ex sorry, special schools are expected to receive the same number of learning hours as primary and secondary mainstream children, as is appropriate by age and stage. And this is also the case within East Renfrewshire. The definition of annual minimum learning hours described by the Scottish Government in its proposal lacks clarity. It is not clear what a learning hour is and is not inclusive of the entirety of learners' experiences. The examples of exemptions do not cover all possibilities, and there is a lack of clarity as to whether schools need to offer the minimum number of learning hours to all pupils by, for example, extending the school year in a similar way to the requirement of 1140 hours provision in early learning and childcare. There is a lack of detail of the practical implications and recording and reporting on learning hours. Defining the minimum number of learning hours in statute further reduces the flexibility local authorities have to design educational services and means that the Council will no longer be able to determine the appropriate number of learning hours to best meet the needs of its school-aged children. Furthermore, this may result in longer-term financial and practical implications. Headteachers across all sectors have been made aware of the consultation and encouraged to respond. And similarly, parent council chairs have also been made aware and have also been encouraged to contribute to the conversation. The council's draft response to the consultation takes the position of not being in favour of implementing legislation to define the minimum number of learning hours and details the reasoning for this. The draft response is included in Appendix 1 and commences on page 73 of your papers. Should the proposal be progressed, the draft response highlights the needs for any financial costs to be fully funded by the Scottish Government and that further clarity of the legislation and associated practicalities should be provided. The consultation opened on the 21st of March this year and will close on the 13th of June. The Education Committee is asked to note and approve the Education Department's response on behalf of the Council to the Scottish Government's consultation on the prescription of the minimum annual number of learning hours of school education school pupils should receive each year. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And do we have any questions or comments with uh, regards to this? Uh, I know uh, a parent council had raised with me that they had concerns about this uh, because um, the minimum hour number of learning hours isn't defined, and they were the questioning were school trips. You had the big day out that could be classed as learning as well. So um, they were very much against it on this basis. So I think that's important that they were consulted, and I would agree with um, the education department's. Um, um, assumption uh, made in, in their response, um, given that we are facing financial difficulties, if the Scottish Government are to implement this policy, we need to, it needs to be backed up with finance, uh, finance, and I think that's really important. So I hope I'll actually support uh, our response to this. Thank you, Councillor Pagno. And, uh, well, yes, yeah, to echo that, that what you're saying, the clarity of the definition of the term learning hours is incredibly important. Uh, sorry. Uh, well, you were supporting it. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Councillor O'Donnell? I think this is a very important cons consultation. It's very comprehensive. It's clearly identified the, the weaknesses in a lot of areas um, uh, in the Scottish Government's proposals. Um, I'm sure 
I'm sure you've already consulted with Councillor Buchanan on, on this paper because as a COSLA spokesperson, um, this is again very much echoes where COSLA's position is. So it's, it's not a political area, it could be seen as political, but there's actually unanimity um, around uh, all COSLA leaders that there are so many weaknesses in this that we have to identify that. So um, I, I fully support this paper. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Donnell. Uh, Councillor Merrick, you haven't raised your hand, but I noticed... Yeah, you have now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll lower it now. Uh, no, th thanks for the, the paper. Uh, yeah, we agree that what we don't want to do is be hamstrung. We want, <coughs> excuse me, the education department to have as much flexibility as possible because the, you know, no matter how we cut or measure this, we are the uh, top performing education system in the country, so education department in the whole country, so we don't want to lose any flexibility or any ability to uh, make our own choices, so we do support the response. Thank you, Councillor Merrick. I think your words are very much appreciated. Uh, any other comments? Or? No? And okay, so we are, as a committee, asked to find the right wording. Recommendation uh, to, to note and approve the Education Department's response to the Scottish Government's consultation on the prescription of the minimum annual number of learning, learning hours of school education school pupils should receive each year, each year. Noted and approved. Okay, thank you. And that is our last item on today's agenda, I think. And so I'd like to thank everyone for attending and everyone's input and comments. Uh, thank you very much.